Hello, and welcome to Breaking All Down. I'm Count Zero. This week, I am returning to James Polish, but not to his City Eaton's in Flight series. And instead, I'm taking on a whole slew of his books at one stroke. Specifically, I'm taking a look at his Star Trek novelizations. In case you've been living under a rock, here's a little primer. When Star Trek came out in 1966, it was incredibly popular. Here was a science fiction television series which took its material seriously, as The Twilight Zone and The Outer Limits did, and Lost in Space didn't, but with a recurring cast of characters that audiences could become fans of and grow attached to, which is something that Lost in Space had, but The Twilight Zone and Outer Limits didn't have. That is, unless you count Rod Serling as a character in The Twilight Zone. All this was helped by the fact that Gene Roddenberry recognized the importance of making Star Trek a show that fi science fiction fans could appreciate by bringing on writers like Theodore R. Sturgeon and Harlan Ellison to write for the show, though Roddenberry wasn't above making adjustments to these luminaries to make their scripts work with his vision of the show, like with City on the Edge of Forever. So at the time, there was no home video. The show, And when the book series started, the show was actually still on the air which means also that the show hadn't, ha hadn't hit the number of episodes needed for syndication. So, if the fans wanted to re-experience particular episodes again, they're out of luck. Or rather, they would be out of luck, were it not for the printed word. When Bantam Books got the rights to put out Star Trek books, one of the things they did, in addition to new works, was they put out a series of what ultimately was 11 books, Adapting most of the broadcast Star Trek episodes, and to write them, they got James Blish. And this is where things kind of get iffy. Because when Blish was writing these, he was living in the UK, and the BBC wasn't broadcasting Star Trek at that time. I mean, to be fair, it was only been one season out, and I could see the BBC going, well, let's wait till the series finishes before we decide to option this for broadcast. But still, where as opposed to other sci-fi luminaries who are in the United States, Blish couldn't watch the show. He wouldn't know what it looked what it looked like. So all he kinda had to work on was scripts. And not all the scripts he got were the shooting scripts, were the final scripts used for the episodes. And not all of these scripts incorporated things that were changed during shooting. This leads to, not say weirdness, but certain differences in how the episodes appear, or how the um, episodes are adapted. For example, um, Dagger of the Mind. In the show, this is the episode where Spock first debuts the Vulcan Mind Metal, where he uses it to get information from the mind of Dr. Van Gelder. In the script, this is kind of written as an interrogation scene, and it's kind of dull. And in the book, it's based in the book where it's ad adapted. It's basically kind of cut out. So, mind meld doesn't appear. This leads kind of the other element of each of the stories, rather than being adapted like a novel length work, like what we see later when, for example. Um, Encounter at Farpoint and the Voyager episode Flashback and a bunch of other stuff uh, is adapted to um, novel form. They're adapted to full-length novels, like 200 pages or more for just the one book or one episode. Here, it's like about 20 pages, 20, 25 pages. Some books spend more time on one episode than others. Um, consequently, stuff gets cut. Some stuff that gets cut is stuff that's worthwhile and important. Other stuff, not not as much. But it's still notable by its absence. good example of this as well is the adaptation episode The Naked Time. In the episode, we get two separate little monologue scenes with Kirk and Spock, each on their own, having been infected by this virus, which breaks down people's inhibitions, coping with inner angst. 
Kirk, it's the fact that he's commanding officer of his ship, but he has feelings for Yeoman Rand. And so he has to balance his duty versus his personal feelings. Um, for Spock, it's related to his having to repress his emotions as a Vulcan with the fact that, well, he cares about his mother. And, he, and as a Vulcan, he is societally prohibited or discouraged from expressing that he cares about his mother. And so, uh, these two scenes both provide a lot of character development for Kirk and Spock. But, they're not in the adaptation. At all. And you can imagine, even for later episodes, when we're getting to works which are written by luminaries of science fiction, like I mentioned earlier, um, Ellison... We get to situations where we're playing, like, narrative telephone. We have Cities on the Edge of Forever, as interpreted by... Was it written by Hal Nelson, as interpreted to the screen, or reinterpreted to fit broadcast standards and practices, by um, Gene Roddenberry, and then reinterpreted to shrink it down to 20 pages or so, by James Blish. And this happens several times. So this happens for Escape Every Story. So we get this really element sense of, of of if you're a Trekkie, if you're a, a diehard Trekkie, or if you've watched all these episodes and know them fairly well, or even just watch them fairly recently and know them, have them fresh in your mind, you read this and go, that's missing, that's missing, that's missing too, that's important, and that's missing, and so forth and so on. Now, later books, because this series actually kept getting published after Trek went off the air, um, and was just in syndication, later books, presumably for that time, Blish started having access to the actual episodes, but the books are still the same length. It's not like, oh, we're going to stretch this out now to 400 pages and give each episode 200 pages in the full workover. It's still the same length. But later episodes, I mean, they're closer to what the final product was, but they're still not without their problems. Consequently, if you're a fan of Trek and are interested in seeing these episodes in a different light, whether looking at them saying, okay, here's how this would have been, that might have appeared from an earlier draft of the script or that sort of thing, these are worth picking up. I do see these on occasion in used bookstores and that sort of thing. A lot of these were sold. I suspect a lot of these ended up, particularly once episodes became available on VHS or DVD, and now DVD, probably a bunch of these ended up back in videos, back in uh, bookstores. Um, I recommend yeah, you bring on picking, picking these up if you are a Trek fan. If you are like re like really a casual Trek fan, or just don't care at all, and is looking for science fiction to read, it's not really worth it. It's it's decent. It's decent science fiction, but there's so much better out there. And Blush himself even did better. In fact, he even did better. I mean, he did full-on books in with the Trek universe that were completely original works, and I will probably take a look at some of, at some of the uh, the early Trek licensed novels, like original licensed no novels, later on in the future, and see how those shaped out. In the meantime, though, next time, hmm, I may do another book review, and possibly step into a realm which I've dealt with in prose reviews on my blog, but haven't done in video yet, and that's the realm of nonfiction. And that's something which you should look forward to. If you enjoyed this episode, please give me a thumbs up, and subscribe to the channel if you want to know when the next episode comes out. And I'll see you next time. <laughs>
Lost in Space didn't, but with a recurring cast of characters that audiences could become fans of and grow attached to, which is something that Lost in Space had, but the Twilight Zone and Outer Limits didn't have. This week, I am returning to James Blish, but not to his City of in Flight series. And instead, I'm taking on a whole slew of his books at one stroke. Specifically, I'm taking a look at his Star Trek novelizations. In case you've been living under a rock, here's a little primer. When Star Trek came out in 1966, it was incredibly popular. Here was a science fiction television series which took its material seriously, as The Twilight Zone and The Outer Limits did, and... Hello, and welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. That is, unless you count Rod Serling as a character in The Twilight Zone. All this was helped by the fact that Gene Roddenberry recognized the importance of making Star Trek a show that fi science fiction fans 